Hello and welcome to our today's webinar in collaboration with the Carter Green Building Council about green home design with CFD. And today I'm uh, very happy that we again have uh, Hamuda Youssef as a guest from the Carter Green Building Council. And um, yes, Hamuda is the head of communications at the Carter Green Building Council. He is an engineer with a background in green building and sustainable engineering. And besides that, he is also leading uh, several working groups um, at the Carter Green Building Council. And he will introduce us today into the world of green building and talk uh, to us about fundamentals of passive design. And my name is Milad. I'm the product marketing manager here at SimScale. And in the last 10 years, I worked in different industries as a simulation engineer and a simulation project manager. And as part of my role at SimScale, I am managing our relationships with organizations like the Carter Green Building Council and conducting uh, several workshops and webinars across different topics from the world of simulation. So, before we start to dive in into our today's topic, let's take a look at our today's agenda. As I mentioned, Hamuda will uh, start our session and introduce you to the fundamentals of passive design. And after that, we'll <coughs> talk about the general benefits of simulation. Uh, I will show you how SimScale makes uh, simulation available to every engineer in the world using your web browser. And then we've prepared a very nice live demonstration where we will show you how we increase the energy efficiency of a residential building by 50% using simulation. And at the end, for sure, we'll have a Q&A session. So in the case you have a question, just write it into the question uh, box of GoToWebinar and Hamuda and me will try to answer them on the fly or latest during the Q&A. Yes, and now it's a big pleasure for me to give over the, the uh, stage to Hamuda. And yes, uh, thank you very much for, for joining today, Hamuda, and we are looking forward to your presentation. And hello and welcome, everyone. I'm Hamuda Youssef. I'm glad to be here with you and with Milad uh, for this webinar uh, with the start of the uh, Green Building Week. Uh, this year, the theme is on green homes, and uh, today's session we will focus more on the residential sector. Uh, let me take it further. Yeah. So when we speak of energy efficiency, even from a residential perspective, it's important to think of energy from a more holistic approach, uh, from a demand efficiency and resources. We tend to think of our homes typically from the look and feel, uh, but sometimes we, we, we forget to think of how our building will perform from an energy perspective. Uh, if we look at different rating systems, and let's take LEED for reference, a um, good number, more than 30% of the points of the certification relies on the energy and atmosphere credits or relies on the energy-related uh, topics. And that highlights how it's important to focus on energy, even when we're doing our homes. Uh, in different perspectives, there are lots of things that can be covered. Of course, this is not LEED for homes but we're referring to LEED BTNC uh, as reference building design construction because in several cases, LEED for homes wouldn't apply for uh, some specific um, countries. Uh, but in, in the essence, it's the same. You can't ma manage what you don't measure. Uh, you need to understand what kind of topics you need to face. And from there, you need to identify your strategy and the best approach to do that. So if, even uh, either if you are an owner or a designer, there are lots of things that need to be considered uh, to tackle energy-related uh, topics. Uh, and these are more or less the main topics that we'll be covering today, uh, from energy demand, energy efficiency, renewable energy, ongoing performance and commissioning. We will not cover all of them, but we will focus more on the passive design approaches and how they can impact all of these other topics as well, with the intent to reduce energy use first, and then next step is to increase energy efficiency. And this is really important to highlight that during design, we face lots of challenges. What, why, and how, as we tend to say, uh, how to create a good building and where and how to do that properly. We face lots of challenges from having uh, cost aspects. Human well-being now is more of a big movement and there are lots of uh, topics there. You find a reading that I would encourage everyone to look at in the whole agreement. Uh, Council website for the Better Places project. Uh, 
uh, and things that need to be taken care of. We have been working with um, several people to identify what we call the environmental design framework. From an environmental design framework, it's important how to take the normal design process and integrate sustainability in early design stages. So for instance, in, in, in this uh, diagram, very simple diagram, when you come to design alternatives, you need to consider what we call the comparison metrics from not just from the cost perspective, but also from environmental perspectives. So it will be part of your selection criteria when you decide what is the best material that I should um, implement. And then from priorities, setting your priorities, it's going for an energy efficient building doesn't mean that you need to have a renewable energy source. This is not the first step that you need to take. The first step is to how to reduce your energy demand and then how to make your building more energy efficient and then at the later stage or at the final stage how you can incorporate renewables. But you can't jump to the renewable stage without reducing your energy demand in the first place. So how to reduce our energy demand? What are the passive techniques that we can recommend? So these will be mainly the highlights that we'll go for over the next few minutes. I will go through them quickly and then we'll have a couple of slides for each. But starting from establishing design energy goals, optimizing building orientation, form and size, maximizing shading potential, using nature or making capitalizing on the natu natural resources from daylight and ventilation, uh, insulating, and that's energy building, uh, efficient building envelope and how to make sure that your building is tight and then monitoring consumption at a later stage. So let's take it one by one. Um, from the first one, which is establishing design energy goals, you need to benchmark yourself. You need to understand, even if you are an owner or a, owner or a designer, what's my reference? If I have uh, an electrical engineer coming and say, OK, you're building, let's say, here for an office space. I, I will design you a building that will consume 120 kilo BTUs per square foot per year. You need to ask yourself, is that good or bad? And to, to do that, you need to have a reference. And the reference is what we call the typical energy use. From that, you can start benchmarking yourself. You can understand where can I go further? What are my targets? Should I go below that? How far can I go? So if the average is 90 kilo BTUs per square foot per year, I, I wouldn't say that I have an energy efficient building with 120 kilo BTUs, for instance. You need to be below that. Then from optimizing your building, it's all of this is the heart of or the core of doing a passive design. How do we shape our building? How do we respect the lo location? And how do you understand our uh, orientation from there? From form and size and orientation all together. Uh, how to design the response to some paths and wind paths uh, and wind directions. Uh, First, to capitalize on occupant, uh, maximize your occupant comfort, how to passively cool and heal the spaces, and make use of the available resources or energy there from the sun. So, and understanding at the same time that, for instance, in your west facade, you will get, if you are in the northern hemisphere, you will get more sun exposure there, more than the northern uh, facade, and so on. Where, where is my prevailing wind direction? So, and this, these kind of things that you need to understand. Second one, I mean, to build up on, on that, how to deal with the building form from different perspective. And this is, in this case, for instance, how to deal with vegetation to, to permit more daylight, let's say, in, in the winter time. So we can use uh, this kind of trees. So in winter time, there are no provide shading elements, southern facade, you have different techniques for shading elements like here, which differs if you bring it from the western facade. You can't have the same technique all the way around. Each facade, each direction requires different solution. And that's something that you need to understand. Lighter color uh, or cooling material for the green roof, again, something to consider. Next one is to utilize software. And I will leave more space for that. Milad will give us a good example a couple of good examples there, but utilize what we have now. 
BIM integration simulation software is all available and they can really help in doing assessments and early ass environmental assessment from the conceptual models. We don't need to do uh, to, re to realize um, detailed design before assessing our buildings. We can do that in early design stages. And from lots of software, you can get what we call the optimum orientation based on the actual location, weather data, and so on. So overall, starting from a shoebox model up to a final design, again, you have different solutions. Each depends on your sun path and the wind, prevailing wind, how to utilize some vegetation over another, and using several techniques. Uh, like in this sketch, we have seen, like if I'm limiting my windows over the wind, the west facade, uh, dealing with more evergreen trees to block the sun uh, heat, which is not the case for the northern facade, for instance, where I want to permit more wind or prevailing wind, cooler wind, and I don't have this much of solar heat gain. Again, a couple of other techniques, understanding the physics and the math of the movement. So where is your summer solace? Where is your winter solace? And so on. Between summer and winter, different sun paths, you can do a shading that only works during summertime, while in wintertime it will permit the sun in. Same thing can happen in courtyards and doing trees, using different trees and vertical passive shading devices. And this to maximize the shading potentials, of course. Again, understanding the shading uh, using softwares is readily available. Lots of softwares now. Second technique is the uh, using nature for daylight and ventilation. Again, as a continuation of the previous topics, but how to permit more daylight in the space. And by permitting daylight, you are saving electricity. You are increasing occupant productivity. And we have lots of studies now and even more certifications uh, for the will building, uh, for the how the building is uh, promoting, uh, promote occupant comfort and productivity. And one of the main factors in all, all of these is uh, promoting daylight or welcoming daylight within the space. Wind, understanding the difference in physics between negative pressure and positive pressure and the wind movement and how to do the air circulation, ventilation, within the space, again, this can ease uh, the ventilation, mechanical ventilation requirements, and in some cases, and even in some uh, good weather, you might turn the, the whole edge back system off. Then insulating building envelope, again, this is very important to understand how can we do the building tightly, to do it in a very tight condition from different perspectives, and again, you need to do some simulation to understand, or not to over-design, uh, your requirement, so it's not more, it's not more uh, the more the merrier. No, it needs to be within uh, specific um, thicknesses, like for insulation, based on each condition um, places. Using other techniques like green roofs. Again, this is gaining more traction now with more of the tendency for urban things like urban farming and urban vegetation. Again, it helps in both ways. Uh, to provide these techniques, not just to insulate the building, but to provide access to the occupants, outdoor spaces, the cities are getting tighter and tighter by the day, so this kind of solutions help in both ways. This is exa an example from one of the projects that is has been completed recently in Doha here, uh, with, as you can see, using different vegetation techniques, uh, using light color materials, no asphalt in the road, all of these in general using light colors for the paints and materials and so on. And all of that with the aim is to minimize or to capitalize on the passive design techniques. And in the end, we'll get a more energy efficient building without a huge capital cost or with, while minim, uh, minimizing our capital costs, of course. So in general, just to finalize and to leave more time to, to Milad for the next part, it's, there are lots of synergies. When we speak of passive energy design, it all relates to lots of things from sustainable sites, as we have seen with the green roofs techniques, water efficiency, uh, materials, occupant comfort, and so on. They are all related, and that's the beauty of green buildings. The integration, 
the holistic approach, so it's not just one solution for all. It's com a combo, let's say, a combo of solutions for a uh, better building. And now it's not just to save energy and water, but even to promote wellness and productivity within the space, uh, either it's residential or offices or anywhere we live. So to finalize, just to summarize what we have discussed so far, so the techniques to reduce our energy demand in our homes, establish design and energy goals, optimize building orientation, form and size, maximize shading potential, use nature as much as we can by daylight and ventilation, insulate, 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 use efficient building envelope, and finally monitoring consumption. You need to make sure that you have readings in place, you understand what your consumption to be able to uh, see if there are any hikes, any leaks that you need to take care of on the spot. So that's my part. Milad, back to you. Thank you. Hamuda, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation and this introduction to uh, passive design. Uh, let me just make myself the presenter and then I can continue with my part of the presentation. So, can you see my screen right now? Yeah, it seems to work perfect. All right, and now I would like to yep. introduce you to the fundamentals and benefits of simulation to understand how we can use this technology to plan green homes and green buildings. Well, and first of all, I would like to start with a ge very general slide about the question what engineering simulation actually is. And if you ask 10 engineers what simulation is, you will get 10 answers. However, um, let's try to, to, to get the big picture. And from my point of view, the best way to understand what engineering simulation is, is to take a look on, on what kind of models we use as in our daily work as engineers. And actually, there are two kinds of models. Uh, the first call of kind of model, I would call it analytical model. And the special thing about this kind of model is that there is a close mathematical solution for the entire domain of the model. And a very good example is the uh, elongation of a spring. Because this is a, an equation or a model we used heavily in schools and universities, and it actually just says that the force, you, the force um, applied on a on a um, spring will result in a elongation of C multiplied with um, the elongation length. So it's like balance between the acting force and the spring and the resulting el elongation of the spring, which is only depending on C, uh, which is our um, factor. And this linear force on the spring, it's really a nice example because this is our model question describing how the force on the spring will change with elongation or the other way around. And it's a very simple equation we can analytically solve and like calculate for every uh, force a corresponding elongation. And in contrast to that, we have numerical models, which we need to use whenever we don't have analytical models for our problem. And the big, big deal with this analytical model is that uh, usually for, let's say, real world systems, it's not possible to solve analytical models. So instead of we use this numerical models, where the idea is that we are approximating the solution of the analytical model uh, using defined support points as well as approximations between them. So if this is a function u we want to approximate using a numerical model, we will, instead of a continuous uh, result, we will just get a solution for some defined discrete points. And in between this point, we have to interpolate, which means that this numerical solution is not as um, precise or as accurate as an analytical solution. However, for most of, of, let's say, real problems, the only way we can solve this, this equations is using numerical models. And engineering simulation, in the end of the day, is applying these numerical methods on the fundamental equations of, of mechanics or thermodynamics, which allows us then to perform virtual experiments. So we can like virtually test 
um, how the flow will distribute inside the building just based on a CAD model. And the reason why you should care about simulation, uh, well, there are several reasons. And I would like to, to talk to you about a very good example, a real world story which shows how important simulation can be. And on the left side, you see the hospital, University Hospital of Aachen. It was built like 40 years ago. And as you can imagine, the HVAC system inside the hospital is very important because on the one hand, you want a sufficient thermal comfort for the occupants. On the other hand, you also need to make sure that, for example, the spread of pollutions is, is, is reduced. And however, uh, when this building was planned, uh, there was no simulation available for, for building engineers. And so they planned all the HVAC ducting just based on the experience. And it ended in a total disaster. Uh, because uh, this, this HVAC ducting system was massively under uh, under designed, and so what they had to do to to reach a sufficient flow rate was to build a second external HVAC ducting system, which you can see on the image. And I'm telling you this because uh, if they would have used simulation and not not only their their experience, this would not happen. And so the great thing about simulation is that it allows us to understand at the very early product development stage how our solution is working. And this allows us at the very early product design stage or building design stage to compare different um, scenarios, to run what-if scenarios, to validate assumptions and to make sure that in the end of the day you know how your system will work before you start to build it. And yes, if we bring this to back to, to some, let's say, general advantages, uh, the two big ideas about simulation are that, first of all, it allows us to test design correctness and efficiency, and that's a very important point, without the need of building a physical prototype. And this can be used uh, uh, differently at uh, different stages of our product development process to reduce time investments, to minimize the uh, risk of, of failures, and finally, that's the result, to reduce massively our costs. And when it comes to the AEC, so the building industry, there are a lot of different applications where we can use simulation. And today we will focus on, on internal flows and thermal comfort, but let's discuss uh, the big picture very quickly. So, first of all, as I mentioned, you can use CFD to validate HVAC system and parts. And this is really a big, big thing because you can not only validate like how single parts are working, so what is the pressure drop uh, inside uh, a duct segment, or how large is uh, the mass flow of a uh, um, um, induced by a, by a fan, but you can also simulate and validate how the overall system is working and how the flow is interacting, starting from where it get, let's say, taken into the HVAC system to the uh, how the flow is, let's say, uh, f streaming inside our duct system and how this flow then is interacting uh, with the with the ambient. And we can use this to improve the performance of our HVAC systems, but also to improve energy efficiency, like to, to make sure that we have the same result, but, but using less, let's say, fresh air or less, less electrical energy. Beside what is happening inside the building, CFD can be also used to optimize uh, the interaction between wind and your building, so you can use it to uh, calculate wind load on facades or to evaluate pedestrian comfort. And uh, we are not only limited to, to uh, let's say, thermal effect, but CFD can also be used to simulate and improve uh, air quality and contamination management. All right. And from what I've told you so far, you must think, well, simulation is such a great tool. Uh, and you will be might be shocked if I tell you that only like 5% of engineers are using simulation of access to such tools. And back then, when SimScale was founded five years ago, we were all uh, talking about what needs to happen to make simulation really a tool which is accessible for all engineers and which is available for everyone. And we talked to several 
engineers. And in the end of the day, we found out that there are three main reasons why people are not using simulation today. The first one is what we call the cost barrier with traditional simulation tools. You need to spend up front, I don't know, 30, 40, 50,000 euros because you need to buy a dedicated simulation software license, you need to buy special high performance computing hardware and so on. But besides the pure cost, another big problem is what we call accessibility. Let's say you would have the hardware and the software license. You would need a specialist who is able to set up the computing infrastructure, who is able to update your software whenever needed, and so on. Which usually is a big problem for small companies because they don't have the money to hire a, a person who's just focusing on that and they don't have, on the other hand, the know-how know and knowledge needed inside their existing team. And the third reason is what we call the know-how barrier, so that most of the tools, simulation tools were designed for simulation experts, but not for, let's say, engineers and people who want to apply the tools. And so our solution to that was SimScale, and SimScale is the first web and cloud-based simulation platform. So it gives you the unlimited power of simulation at your fingertips through your web browser. And the only thing you need for this is a standard web browser like Firefox, Chrome, and uh, for sure you also need um, a working internet connection and that's it. And this is really great because it gives you actually unlimited access to simulation. And now let's discuss some of the most important features of SimScale. And the first thing I would like to raise up is what we call all-in-one solution. So usually or traditional simulation tools. You need to buy a dedicated license for every module. So there is a fluid flow module, a structural mechanic module. If you want to use, let's say, more than 20 processors, you need to buy a high performance computing module and so on and so on. And with SimScale, that's a pass because SimScale is based on a very simple system. Everyone is using the same kind of, of, of tools and actually you got access to all of the tools of SimScale. Uh, the next thing is that SimScale is super fast and easy. Uh, because it's independent from your device and local computing infrastructure. So if you want to get started, you just need to go on simscale.com, create a free account, and in five minutes you can start to simulate. And this is related to our cloud-based approach of SimScale, which uh, makes it unnecessary to download software, to install software, or to configure any local hardware. And another great thing is our real-time support. So SimScale, the SimScale platform is 100% integrated with our support infrastructure and you actually can get support using integrated platform chat, phone, email. And besides this, we also offer consultancies as well as free webinars and, and dedicated professional trainings. And there are a lot of other advantages, but I don't want to read out the full slide. So if you have more questions related to that, like about our pricing model, which is actually starting for, from, from zero, so you can simulate for free, about our collaboration features, our security features, just feel free to contact my colleagues uh, or me by email, phone, or whatever you prefer. And now let's start to talk about CFD and green building. And the first very important thing is to understand when we can use CFD. And this is not only limited, let's say, by technical aspect, but also by some regulations. Because, uh, as you know, the uh, US Green Building Council and its members, like the Carter Green Building Council, are developing right now a standard which is called ASHRAE 189.1. And this is a special standard which uh, massively includes how simulation can be used for green building and how the results can be included to the certification process. However, taking a look at the standard, it will come out that there are some areas where you can actually not use CFD or simulation, uh, like water usage, site sustainability, and surface finishes. Let's say if you want to simulate how many water is used. You don't need the engineering simulation model because it's more a statistical model. It's something you can calculate out of how many people are living or working there. And you don't need any simulation. The same with surface finishes. Um, however, there are some other very important points which can be associated with airflow and CFD and which are part of, of the standard, including thermal comfort for human occupancies, ventilation for acceptable indoor quality, and energy consumption efficiency. And today we will focus on a demo which is dealing with the 
first and last point with thermal comfort and with energy consumption. And however, when it comes to um, do an internal flow simulation of a building or of a room, there are two scenarios we can simulate and both of them have specific requirements what we need. Uh, let's first talk about natural ventilation. So natural ventilation is everywhere where we have like uh, a resulting airflow uh, because of, of ambient pressure effects and because of, of let's say, uh, for example, winds or something like that. And the easiest example is just imagine you have a, a closed room, you have an open window and inside this you have obstructions. And so the air is coming inside your room through the opening and then it's interacting with the obstructions. And this is, a, let's say, the three type of, of elements our model is made of. We have obstructions, openings and the overall domain. And if we want to do a natural ventilation simulation of our house, the overall domain is really the space around the building, then we have the building inside the obstructions, and then we would, for example, add a global flow coming from the right side. And we use different kind of boundary conditions to specify how our air is interacting with the object. So we have flow conditions, so we can define velocity and pressure values or profiles at, at surfaces. And we have, in addition, optional thermal conditions, which we can also use if we want to consider natural convection, including a temperature boundary condition on surfaces, heat generation uh, uh, boundary conditions, or heat transfer boundary conditions. Or another, let's say, discipline of CFD for green building is simulating what we called uh, mechanical ventilation. And there it's very similar. The first big difference is we don't need to consider anymore what is happening outside the building because now our airflow is supplied through inlets and outlets. And then we have again obstructions over building and what we call exhaust and supplies. So supplies are bringing fresh air into the system and exhausts are used to remove them. Again, we have boundary conditions. We have the same boundary conditions like we have for, for the um, Passive ventilation, the only difference is that we also can use passive scalars to track, for example, uh, how um, particles or, 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 or other things will be transported with the air. All right, and now let's take a look at our today's topic. And today we want to discuss how the cloud-based CFD platform of SimScale can ha help to, to make design decisions in building projects uh, and so what we will do is to take a look at following scenario. Let's say we are planning a new residential building, which is made of a lot of identical apartments looking like this. So we have a living room, a bedroom, a small kitchen, uh, uh, a toilet and, and, and other stuff. And we have, first of all, we want now to, to find out what's the best and most efficient way to heat this room. And we have some heat sources like the TV which is running, but the fridge could also be a heat source, or here are these dummies we used for, for the heat released by, by occupants inside the room, and we have an exposed surface C, which is a large window, and where we expect to have a lot of heat transfer. And as I mentioned, the, the human occupancy and the TV are the minor heat sources, and now we want to optimize the, the way we bring the heat into the system to make sure the thermal comfort is as good as possible and the other side, the energy consumption is as low as possible. And therefore, we have two different scenarios we will consider. The first scenario is using underflow heating, which is applying the heat directly to the full floor of, of the building. And option two is using a forced or mechanical ventilation scenario where we have a blower heating unit which is drawing the air into the extractor and blowing the heated air out the sides. And here we can change the, uh, the temperature of the air supplied. In contrast to that, the, the optimization variable for the design scenario one is the power range applied to the floor. And now, we, I want to quickly show you how to prepare such a simulation. And therefore, let's switch 
just in a few seconds to SimScale flood pump. However, the first step is what we call the cat import. So you need to ex prepare your model in your cat system, independent if you're using Revit or AutoCAD or Rhino, whatever. Make it watertight, make it a solid model, and upload it to SimScale. And the great thing is we have really a lot of different file formats we can directly import, including exchange file formats like STAP and IGES, but also native file formats like SolidWorks, AutoCAD, and Rhino. Once this is done, the next step is called meshing. And during the meshing, you are defining like which local accuracy of your simulation you're looking for. And therefore, your model is divided in small cells. And as small as the cells are, as more, more let's say, information you would get, because we will only calculate a mean well, uh, pressure and velocity value for every center of the cells. Then you're going to set up the boundary conditions. And finally, you can run the simulation and post-process it in your web browser. Let's switch to that tab. Here you can see the project we're going to discuss in the next minutes. Uh, it was created by one of my colleagues called Darren. So let's first of all make a copy and copy this project to our own SimScale workspace. Just need to log in or create a new account in the case you don't have an account so far. Yeah, and now we can make a quick copy and take a look at the project on SimScale. It can take up to one minute since, you know, the, all the simulation data need to be copied now on the cloud. And by the way, um, I will make this project public now so everybody can find it now on SimScale.com. Yes, and All right, now let's take a look at the project. And by the way, if you're wondering, uh, today we are going to launch uh, the new uh, Workbench to Null, which is a, really a huge step. And yeah, so you're one of the first guys who can see it. So it's a little bit different. You can see the geometries we've used. So this is the geometry of the, the house, we can hide the wall so the house looking inside. Yes, then as you can see we have for both variants on the floor and blower we have what what I call the mesh. So this is the mesh and you can see like it was created automatically and you can see how it was refined in the near of edges and stuff like that. And then we have a lot of different simulations. So, and now let's take a look at some of the simulation results. So we have two constraints. One is the comfort, the other is the cost. So the, and the cost in the end are representing the amount of energy used to, to, to run the system. And the parameters we have are the heating design, so scenario one or two. And also, we can find just, let's say, the energy use, so the, the power use for the underflow heating or the blower thermostat temperature. And this is the overview. So in total, we are going to simulate 14 different simulations. We have seven scenarios where we are increasing the amount of power supplied to the system. So for the underflow uh, design, it means we are increasing the power applied on the floor uh, and for the design blower we change the inlet temperature um, the correspondence to uh, uh, you know uh, heating power and and blowing power and this together results in the net energy used and yeah so let's go and take a look at the different results and as I mentioned, we are going to use the cost functions. The cost functions are functions which allow us to compare different uh, scenarios and help us to find out which is the best scenario for us. And we do two things. One, to, to judge about the costs is, let's say, uh, the cost associated with the energy we need. And the other thing we need is the comfort. And for the comfort, we're going to use the pre um, the PMV and uh, PMV is a, a value defined in the ASHRAE standard 
which helps us to understand if flow conditions are comfortable or not. And the PMV is calculated based on the operative temperature and the airspeed. And as you can see, um, we have uh, like the, the ideal uh, PMV value is zero. And we have minus three to plus three. Uh, and plus three means too hot and minus three means too cold. And so in our case, closer to to, to zero is the best, and we want will calculate the the PMV out of the velocity and pressure field of our simulation, and that's very important now because the question is where do we want to apply this criteria? Where do we want to check how big PMV is? And we could apply it on the full building, which doesn't really make sense because usually at the the higher higher areas of of um, the the uh, building of the rooms, you, you don't have any persons inside, so we define it this areas where we will e evaluate the PMV inside the sleeping space and the living space. And as I mentioned, we will use this cost function now to weight up advantages and disadvantages of each design, including both comfort and the, the costs. And in this simple case, we just use that cost function, which is very simple, but for let's say Real-world projects, you can use much, much complexer cost functions. Yeah, and now let's take a look at the results. So, first of all, the cost function was a scenario number. And here you can see that uh, this value is changing. Lo lower is better. We can see that we have the overall lowest cost for scenario number five in general, and especially for scenario number five was a fan heater. And for scenario number three, for example, it's the only point where the underflow heating is performing better than the fan heater. And so now we can use this graph, which tells us that we should take a look at scenario number five. And also when we take a look now at, at the, the mean PM, absolute mean PM view inside the thresholds we defined, uh, you can see that actually solution number five, or scenario number five, has the lowest absolute PMV, which is the best. Now let's take a look at some of the results. So first of all, let's take a look on what is happening at the exposed cold wall, where the flow is, is cooling down and sinks at the exposed phase. First of all, for underflow heating was 800 watt, which is scenario uh, five, I think. And here you can see what is happening. So the hot air is rising from the floor, and then it's hitting the cold wall, cools down, and then it sinks. And if we use uh, blower heating, the whole air inside the room is much better mixed. We have enhanced mixing, and not only um, the natural convection. And you can see that less of the flow is streaming on the cold wall. And if we now take a look at the temperature distribution on this, this exposed wall and of the windows, you can see that it's much, much colder for underflow heating, and these blue cold areas are much smaller for the blower version. And that's very interesting, because for me that was the first, let's say, time I really understood what what thermal management in a building means, touching these cold windows in a warm room. Here you can really see this. it's a big, big difference. And now if we take a look at the final results and compare it. So we invested six hours of manual time for preparing the simulation and the geometries. It took us five hours uh, of, of computing time to, to, to calculate the simulation results. And in detail, we received a fl detailed flow analysis for both scenarios. At, uh, we had uh, a fair conversation between design decisions, and at the end of the day, we identified the best solution, which is designed to at scenario six, and this is the overall save of 50% of energy. Yeah, and finally, before uh, we start the Q&A, let me show you some of the simulation results, how they look in the web browser. So example, here we can choose blower heating. And then even take a look at the simulation results and start the post-processing.
Now, for example, we can create a cut plane, visualize, let's say, for example, the flow velocity. Now we can, for example, change the legend. Now we can like visualize different hotspots. And for example, so this is The living room, you can see like how, and this red thing you see, this is the air leaving from the outlets and inlets, and yeah, you can post process the results in 3D very easily. All right, and that's from my side. Thank you very much for being with us today. And now in the case you have a question, uh, it's a perfect situation for you. Just write them and choose a question toolbox and we will try to answer them. All right, it seems like all questions were answered on the chat so far. If you get a question in the meantime, uh, don't be shy, you can reach out to me or to Hamuda by email. And also, since the question was asked several times, those of you who've joined for the live session will receive this, uh, a certification for the lead points in the next couple of, 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 of Oh, there's a question by Chris Roof, and Chris wants to know how do you specify airflow from a fan? Chris, that's a good question. Let's directly take a look at the simulation. First of all, I have to, to say that there are a lot of different possibilities. And you can actually define a resulting mass or volume flow, or you can define a fan rotating velocity and the fan geometry, and then the, the flow is calculated automatically. In this case, let's take a look at the boundary condition used for the blowers, for example. Uh, you can see that for this phase, we've defined a mass flow from 0 0.2 meters, 0 0.2 cubic meters per second. And, and the temperature both. You can def define it directly. Shana wants to know if we have free tutorials on such type of simulations and how to fix the boundary condition. Shana, yes. We have a SimScale public library. It's on simscale.com. You just go on public projects and then you can look for public projects and tutorials, for example. Let's look for HVAC. And then you can, for example, take the simulation of the thermal comfort in a movie theater to calculate it with ASHRAE 55 and usually we also describe very detailed how to set up such a kind of simulation yourself. Seems like all the questions were answered. Thank you very much for being here with us. It was a great pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it and stay tuned for our next webinars, the next collaborations with the Carter Green Building Council. Again, thank you very much, Amudo, for being with us here and I wish you all a wonderful rest of the week. Have a nice day. Bye.